This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Aaron Newcomb and I talk with Avery Pennerun of Tailscale, picking up where we left off last January. In the meantime, his company got a $100 million investment, and he's just as deep and thoughtful as ever and dealing with more problems than ever. And just a lot of great stuff on this show, and that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 696, recorded Wednesday, August 31st, 2022. Tail scale gets hot. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Collide is an endpoint security solution built around honest security. You can meet your security goals without compromising your values. Visit collide.com slash floss to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. And by IRL, an original podcast from Mozilla. IRL is a show for people who build AI and people who develop tech policies. Hosted by Bridget Todd, this season of IRL looks at AI in real life. Search for IRL in your podcast player. Good morning, good evening, good whenever it is, wherever you are and whoever you are. I'm Doc Searles. You're not, and that's fine. With me today is, uh, is that's probably a good thing, is, uh, is Aaron Newcomb. Uh, this is a, a repeat engagement with this guest. How are you doing, Aaron? Good, good. Yeah, thanks for having me back. It'll be good to uh, to talk to Avery again. Yeah, yeah. So this is a... Uh, it was actually, I think, it's a weird thing. We, um, I was listening to Conan O'Brien being interviewed, and he said, I hate to say it, I've had 10,000 guests in my life. I don't remember most of them. <laughs> I don't remember who was on and when. <laughs> and, and in this case, um, I think it was Dave Tatt, who's been on recently, who said, you've got to have Avery on. And we booked him again. And actually, I forgot that we already had him on. And what I did remember, though, when I re-listened to the show, um, was what a good show it was. <laughs> and, and, and we always say to people, we have to have you back. So usually we, we wait a year or more, but we didn't wait that long this time. So uh, do you remember yeah, much no, of what the, what I remember a few things. I remember, I remember talking about his, you know, he's got a long history and I, re- well, you know, I don't want to age him too much, but <laughs> he's been doing this for a long time, let's just say. And I remember talking about his uh, pen name, right? I forget what it is, uh, oh, but right. the, he had a long Appenor. story about how that, yeah, that's it. And he had a long story about how that came about. And um, and then we, uh, you know, we had a, just had, a, like, I think, a general talk about open source in general. Right. And we talked about a number yeah. of different projects. And then we talked about his project, which was um, Tailscale. Tailscale. Right? Yeah. Tailscale. Yeah. So I do remember it. I, I, I will admit that my memory is not as good as it used to be. So I don't remember everything <laughs> we talked about. But I do remember a few things. Well, the whole point with short-term memory is that you remember the meaning, but not necessarily what anybody said exactly. So um, <laughs> I just took a whole bunch of notes, which I have over here. There's some things I want to want to get to. Uh, yeah, as we just said, uh, Avery Pennerun is, has, uh, uh, has a great history. He's worked for Google Fiber, uh, many other companies. He's had a series of startups. Um, and um, his, his big project right now, his company is Tailscale. Uh, he uses WireGuard with that. Um, has some amazing thoughts that we he went over in the last time about how how companies scale. Really interesting stuff. So I guess so, Avery. Let's bring you on, and maybe we could start there with uh, there he is. Hey man. Hello. So so um, you're somewhere in Canada, I guess. Uh, is that right? That Still? is correct. Today I'm in uh, Montreal. In Montreal. So. Um, I, it's it's funny, by the way, that, about Montreal. Of, um, I love Montreal and I love Toronto. And but am I wrong about this? But I found that Toronto and Montreal have a relationship, kind of like San Francisco and Los and and Los Angeles, where everybody in San Francisco hates Los Angeles, but Los Angeles thinks San Francisco is a nice place to go. Um, is it similar <laughs> that way with 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 Toronto and Montreal? I kind of got that. Montreal like seems to hate Toronto, but Toronto says Montreal's cool. 
Or yeah, there's, do, is there's that definitely an... an element of competition between the two two cities. Uh, <laughs> I would say we, we tease Toronto quite a bit because, of, you know, mainly because of their ability to handle snow in the winter because they don't get that much snow. So when they do get a snowfall, everything shuts down. And Montreal is like, <laughs> that's just a normal day. Uh, but they, they do. They are the center of the business world in Canada. So I guess we have to we have to hand them that. <laughs> that that's funny because I, I remember that there's this thing about you know, Toronto where they say it actually doesn't snow here that much, you know, and maybe that's why they, they don't, they're not, they're not equipped for it. I found that like when I lived in North Carolina, they say, no, it never snows down here. And then when it does, everything shuts down, nothing happens. Right. <laughs> yeah, it, actually, exactly. it actually does snow there sometimes. Um, anyway, so, so what is the Delta between January when we talked and now is, is there, is everything, in the last show, we talked about the transition from new to hot to big and what was involved in that. And and I'm wondering if you've grown that much since then or if you've changed your mind about anything since the last show. Well, sort of I, I personally there. am more or less the same size as before. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, the, the good news about, about us not necessarily remembering everything we talked about is probably your audience doesn't remember everything we talked about either. So we can just talk about the same stuff. And if it was good last time, it should be good again this time. Um, but yeah, I think, I think I remember near the end of, of our hour last time, we're like, Hey, we didn't actually talk about tail scale at all <laughs> in this whole conversation. <laughs> uh, right. So I, I guess, I guess we could maybe mention that Let's start uh, this there. time around, Yeah, <laughs> but I'm happy to talk about whatever, you know, I've got no, lots please of do. That's a good one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, let's see. I, I remember, uh, at the time, Aaron was a big fan of Tailscale. Uh, the super short version of Tailscale is it's a mesh network based on WireGuard. Um, and it lets your, your computers talk to each other, uh, across the internet They're through time and space, no matter where they are. So you can have a laptop in one cafe somewhere and a phone in another cafe somewhere else. And they managed to create a point to point connection between them. That's end to end encrypted. That doesn't go through any relays. Um, and then you can, you know, browse a web server that's running on your laptop from inside your phone. So it's, it's pretty neat from a technology point of view, because it brings you back. And I remember we talked about IPv6 and stuff a little bit last time. It brings you back to the way the internet was in the very, very, very early days when everybody had an IP address, nobody had any firewalls. Uh, you could just run a service and then someone could connect to your service. So it has this sort of like, I don't know, a little bit of a retro uh, technology vibe to it where like this is you know th like the good old days you were just joking about movies from 1990 right or, or from the 1990s and like Tailscale is sort of like well networking was kind of good in the 1990s other than being slow and unreliable so if we just like take modern fast reliable stuff but make it good that would be a pretty enjoyable experience you know I, this last week um, uh, my wife Joyce and I went to D Web Camp um, uh, which the Internet Archive and friends put on in the Redwoods in Northern California. And it's all about the distributed web. And it, there's an awful lot of kind of productive nostalgia for the world of the 90s. Um, you know, when, like in my case, I had, I had my own IP address uh, or addresses. I had like 16 IP addresses. I had like three or four boxes under my desk. Those were webs. There's a web server. There's a mail server. There was a kind of a relay box where I put in articles I was writing for Linux journal and they get pushed up. There'd be a cron job that ran overnight and pushed it up to some other server that, that, uh, that Linux journal maintained in Seattle. I was in, I guess I was in, uh, center, you know, uh the Bay area at that time. And that's not even, it was not only really not doable, it's barely thinkable now. And everybody wants to kind of get back. And I'm wondering whether, um, like web three has actually come up as a topic also web five like thank you jack dorsey <laughs> for um giving us that as well both of those are kind of aspirational around redistributing power from the from the big centers to new edges and i'm wondering if that has any effect on your business or if you just have some thoughts about how that goes well i think a lot of people are interested right now in redistributing power. I think that's a, we can have a huge economic discussion about what's going on with power and stuff uh, lately, but it's, it's not good news. I think the internet of the nineties, I remember really clearly the optimism everybody had about how it's gonna solve the world's problems, right? Like world peace through uh, better communications and like information wants to be free. 
Um, and you know the the cost of duplicating things is going to go to zero, and so all these amazing things are going to be possible, and we're not going to have to, you know, duplicate effort, and there's not going to be bureaucracy because we can cut through that with computers and so on. And it's it's been really interesting, you know, in the time since the '90s, I think as a society we've gotten less optimistic about technology, right? A lot of bad stuff has started coming out, um, and people have started, in particular manipulating the network to produce the bad things uh, where if maybe everybody had been playing on the same side, we could have a much better internet today than we would have had. Does that make sense? Yeah, there, there's, um, I, I used to have a series of laws uh, that really weren't, but they were fun to write about. And one of them was progress is the, is how the miraculous becomes mundane. And, with tech, there's there's always great optimism. I mean, there would not be a Wired magazine if there wasn't this great optimism about the future. Um, and it's always going to be kind of utopian. Um, and that was the case for me. I mean, I was labeled, I think, correctly a techno-utopian. The, the book I wrote, the first book I co-wrote, The Clue Train Manifesto, was absolutely a, a, a tech-utopian um, tome. And the opening line with it was the, we had 95 theses because that worked for Martin Luther. And we call it a manifesto because that worked for Marx. And the word clue train is still tweeted some number of times a day. But the opening clue was instead of we have one clue to get this year, it's that we are not seats or eyeballs or end users or consumers. We are human beings. Our reach exceeds your grasp. Deal with it. And it was addressed to the big companies of the world. And that is still absolutely wrong. <laughs> our reach not only fails to exceed their grasp, their grasp is around our throats and in our brains and in so many other places all the time to the point where um, surveillance is so normalized that uh, it's hard for people to imagine life without it. And and we depend on it to some degree. I mean, you know, there's AI and everything and, and we kind of want that to some degree, but... So I'm wondering if you, but, but that's also tied up with the nostalgia, which is that we did, you know, those of us who are old enough to remember the nineties, we did experience kind of defaulted privacy, kind of like we have in the physical world. We actually were all running around naked, but we at least respected each other. You know, we weren't busy spying on each other. An ad was an ad. It was aimed at a, you know, it was aimed at populations. It wasn't aimed at me. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or how that fits in with with where things are going, but I'm sure you do. Yeah, well, I mean, j just so you know, the Clue Train Manifesto, by the way, is what got me into blogging in the first place because uh, I was <laughs> at my first first startup at the time and we didn't really know how to talk to like customers in the outside world and stuff. And I'm like, OK, well, one easy thing I can do is just write stuff and put it online. Um, and to tie that all, all together, I actually when I started publishing my blog, I actually pulled up all of the other stuff I had previously written and then added it as retroactive blog posts uh, that go into the past. So if you push the back button enough times on my blog, and you have to push it quite a lot of times because we're up to quite a few articles now, <laughs> you can go all the way back to 1995 and read some of my high school essays. Um, and one of them was actually, I, I remember it pretty well. I read some article in 1995 about how there's in the future, you're going to be able to just like watch video on the internet and it'll be like on demand. So you can just click on a movie and it'll feed you the video right away. And I, my essay was about how like, I was just using dial up internet for the first time, like that year. It was like, that sounds like such a depressing vision of the internet. Um, just the capability to communicate with anybody in the world in real time. And what we're going to use it for is watching movies. Uh, there's, there's got to be more to it than that. Um, and I think, you know, <laughs> looking back at past me many, many years ago, I was like, I, I guess I, I had the right idea there. That is depressing. Uh, and it happened anyway. And the, the nice thing is that all of that stuff is able to exist on the internet, right? You know, I watch a lot of movies on the internet and it turns out to be pretty good. Um, but I also communicate with a lot of people on the internet and that turns out to be pretty good. And I think one of the things you got right in the Clue Train Manifesto was that companies were not talking to people in a productive way. They were treating customers as a one-way communication channel. And the most successful companies today don't treat customers as a one-way communication channel. They treat them as a, a, a two-way communication channel that also spreads messages on its own, right? The, the idea of like memes, not just the images, but memes like concepts spreading between across groups of people. As a society, we have a way better understanding of that now. I think... What maybe you missed is that once society learned this, 
they all decided to take advantage of it to go back into marketing stuff, right? So a lot of these memes are manufactured by companies and, and stress tested to see which things will spread better. And then the things that spread better, they intentionally push them and those things spread across the internet really fast. This was something that we had never really expected as a society that when you connect people together with so much throughput, with so much ability to communicate, with such low latency, with so much fairness where everybody, anybody can say anything, that you'll create all of these problems instead of necessarily these good things. And there's this, there's this book by an author who's, I can't remember the name of the book or the name of the author, which is really inconvenient right now. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a Canadian author, and he wrote this series about... Um, it starts off where they're doing genetic modification and people are living under underwater near one of the coral reefs and they have to do something down there and they have to like modify them and be able to survive at these depths or whatever. But the book just gets into, you know, or the series of books after you get out of that part gets into what society is like at the time. And he absolutely nailed what happened to the internet, you know, years after he wrote the book, right? This idea of like the internet is mostly garbage most of the effort that you're spending on the internet is sorting through garbage, trying to find the good parts. And that's not what it was like in the 90s, right? There was just, there was not enough people on the internet to be producing enough garbage for us to have to sort through. There was actually, you could, it was easier to get the signal out of the noise. Uh, it was easier because there wasn't as much, there just wasn't a, a, as much mass that you had to weed through. But I don't know, there was a lot of garbage <laughs> even back then. <laughs> well, yeah, there was days. definitely a lot of garbage, right? But it wasn't intentionally yeah. created garbage that is like trying to crowd out the signal. Right. The, the difference now is that there's, there's a sort of, it's hard to describe except mathematically, I guess, but like as things get bigger, the probability of something really bad evolving in that thing and then spreading really fast gets higher. So like a small network is less likely to evolve the huge predator that like wipes out the whole network, but a huge network is virtually guaranteed to evolve that kind of predator. Yes. If, does yeah, that much, make sense? Much more, it hundred percent does because uh, the company I work for does security software. So this makes total sense. Uh, but yeah, things like crypto jacking or uh, vulnerabilities, the number of vulnerabilities, if you have 10 servers, you know, yeah, you may have a vulnerability on one of them, but if you have 10,000 servers, you may have a lot of vulnerabilities on a lot of servers, leaving you much more exposed. Um, right. Like the very first and with the way Morris things are automated out, today, there was something like, sorry, no, no, go ahead. I was going to say the very first Morris worm that came out when I think there were like 40,000 people total on the internet, right? And and nobody expected like, oh, you could write a program that can just spread itself between computers using a vulnerability. Right. And now we all kind of know that. But like the bigger the Internet gets, the bigger these attack or the, the more common these attacks get, because one person discovers a problem. And then there's millions of people who have the ability to take this problem and, you know, scalably spread it to as many computers as possible. And this is leading to all of these problems of the Internet where we have to lock down our own privacy and and security and even freedoms in order to protect ourselves against these these wild predators wandering around that just didn't exist before. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we found in, um, I don't want to make this too much of a plug, but I, I work on a, a report every year, security and uh, container usage report. And one thing we found last year was that 76% of container images um, are running as root. Uh, mm -hmm. which is a big no-no, obviously, right? Because you're basically exposing yourself. So yeah, you're absolutely right that this has, as the internet has grown, um, uh, the exposure level and the ease of which things can spread um, has also uh, changed because everything's automated now, right? With containers and and Kubernetes and things like that, you know, these, we, we're, we're putting more updates out more often and that is also another vector for, for things to go wrong. Um, so I've got a lot of other questions. One thing I wanted to get to, and then maybe we can talk a little bit, uh, delve into some more of these topics. One thing I wanted to get into, though, was TailScale and the connection that, besides yourself, of course, the connection that it has with open source. Can you, because I know TailScale is a commercial company. Yeah, I think you guys just mm -hmm. had a really big uh, funding round, right? Earlier this spring, you got our summer. Yeah, you guys might have happened nice right program. after I talked to you guys. I can't remember. Yeah, it was like $100 million, right? We raised uh, $100 Series million. B dollars. funding. Yep. That's awesome, dude. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, what's the what, so what's the connection between this big commercial company and open source? Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a huge open source person. I've been doing open source since 
uh, since I first discovered Linux in 1994. Uh, and it's, it is very important. One of the, one of the things I like most about open source is no matter how much I screw up a company that I've built along the way, uh, at least the open source that I made while I was at that company can survive. So there's like projects from my first startup in the early 2000s that are like still in use today by some, by people. Uh, one of the weirdly most common ones is this program called WV dial or weave dial which is a modem dialer for dial-up internet, which you'd think by now would certainly have died out, but it hasn't because it turns out people still use it for like dialing on LTE modems that are connected over USB ports that's, that are still to this day simulating like ATDT, blah, 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 uh, <laughs> modem behavior. Um, so it's, it's neat that open source lives through the ages like that. And I think tail scale, we went in and we're like, okay, well, first of all, we're a bunch of open source people. We just like open source. We want to make sure we're doing open source things. Uh, but we want to do this open source in a way that's going to be sustainable uh, because there's way too many projects that start off as open source and then get crushed when somebody shows up with a proprietary solution uh, that is better in some ways, worse in several ways, usually worse in security and privacy. Uh, but they've got the virality thing going and they have money behind it and they're going to push it through regardless, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, the one of the things I say to to people at Tailscale is like, look, we, we are good people. We want to be good people. But sooner or later, the Facebook of networking is going to appear. And our job is to stop the Facebook of networking from taking over this time. Um, I guess I, I don't like to be I shouldn't be too hard on Facebook, but I, but I am hard on Facebook. I think there's a lot of evil that comes out of Facebook on purpose. Right. There's there's a difference between like, whoops, I accidentally uh, stepped on something uh, and destroyed it because I'm huge versus like, I just don't care. I, I think I want to eliminate this thing and destroy it. Right. And, and yeah. but the network effect that drove Facebook to its huge success is is unstoppable when it's done well. Right. So you don't want to be the lose losing side in a battle of network effects or all of the work that you do is wasted. Right. So Tailscale is this, in this really interesting spot where we want to make make an open source system that's going to improve the state of networking. And that does tie back to the stuff I was talking about, where big networks are less secure. Tailscale, the joke behind the name is it's, it's the opposite of Internet scale. Um, <laughs> if you make small networks, the small networks won't evolve the kinds of threats that big networks will have. So what we really want is a whole bunch of small networks that you can interconnect in safe ways. Right. But. By doing that, we have to be really careful about the virality and the way things spread to make sure that we, the people who are trying to build something good, don't get trampled on by people who don't care about that stuff. And so it's a really interesting line that we end up drawing. Almost all of Tailscale is open source. Uh, the exception is some of the proprietary or some of the like front ends for proprietary operating systems like Windows, for example. Uh, the front end is not open source, but you can install the, the tail scale code from the open source repository and run it on Windows and it works fine. Um, and then there's the control service that like coordinates all of your nodes together and we keep that part proprietary just as a way of having a central focal point of being able to push updates and stuff like that. And that's that's important because a completely open standard would be too slow to evolve and that would create fertile ground for somebody with fewer ethics than us to come in and create something that's more centrally controlled and more viral. Now that said, there is an open source Tailscale control server called Headscale. It wasn't created by us, but we sort of support the developers of Headscale. And so you can run a fully open source Tailscale environment using Headscale if you want. But naturally, you know, our, our job is to focus on the, the Tailscale server. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That was a I, long story. <laughs> I, 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 I like the head, the head and tail um, uh, bookends for that. It's a this, this is a really rich and important thread. But I have to interrupt it and let people know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Um, uh, IT admins often feel like they have to choose between their commitment to cybersecurity and their duty to protect employees' privacy. Naturally, you need to safeguard company data against hacks and breaches, but you don't want to turn your workplace into 1984. Traditional MDMs give the IT team complete access and control over company devices, but since employees are inevitably going to use their work laptops for personal activities, uh, these tools could saddle you with surveillance capabilities you never wanted, like access to photos and browser history. And before you know it, your end users are complaining about all security agents showing up on their laptops. 
Developers are frustrated by the lack of autonomy. People start secretly working on their personal devices to get things done. It's easy to fall into the trap of top-down security, but that's not the only option. Collide is an endpoint security solution built around honest security. Their philosophy is that employees aren't your biggest security risk. They're your biggest allies, and your relationship with them should be based on transparency and informed consent. Collide works by notifying your employees of security issues via Slack, educating them on why they're important and giving them step-by-step instructions on how to resolve them themselves. For IT and security teams, Collide provides the right level of visibility for Mac, Windows, and Linux devices, and it addresses high-risk issues that can't be solved through brute force or automation. What's more, your end users can see exactly why and how every piece of data is being collected via Collide's User Privacy Center and their open source code base. You can beat your security goals without compromising your values. Visit collide.com slash floss to find out how. If you follow that link, they'll hook you up with a goodie bag just for activating a free trial. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash floss. Okay, so... so so this is there's sort of two topics going on here. Uh, every one is how open source the company is. And, um, and also this transition from new to hot to big that we talked about last time. So, um, uh, so we don't get too far down that it might be a rat hole, but it's, but you've, you obviously crossed the chasm here. You just got a big funding. You're going to be big <laughs> or you want to be big, I assume, or big enough. I don't know what, I mean, big is relative. Um, but also in your last blog post, which by the way was last year, and you haven't blogged yet this year, so I, that's interesting Time to flies. me as well. Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm blogging much less frequently than I used to as well. Um, uh, you made this wonderful distinction between free software as a as a as a gift and open source as something else, and. Um, I said some really great quotes on that. I, I advise people to go looking at at the uh, at at his blog for for this stuff. Um, I, I, if you remember it, <laughs> you remember what you wrote there. Do you want to revisit that for us? Because I think it's an it's important a distinction in part because most people don't understand free software. They kind of understand open source because it's simple. You know, it doesn't have right. the gift property, but the gift property of of free software is pretty important, I think. Yeah. So So I I wrote this, yeah, I wrote this article in response to, it was several months ago now, but the whole log4j kerfuffle. And I didn't Mm -hmm. mention log4j by name in the blog post, because I don't think log4j deserves to be dragged through the mud necessarily. Uh, But the, I was, I was sort of getting grumpy about the online discourse about how log4j, how did this bug even happen? Um, how do we get rid of this problem? Like what's wrong with the developers? How come they're not fixing it? And it's like, well, look, th- these are people who are donating their time to work on this library that last week you all thought was great. Uh, and now they found a bug and actually they, they issued a release or a fix for this bug, like two days or something after the, the announcement came out, but there's millions of different applications cause it's Java and everybody like embedded the library in these apps. And so this, this bug is, is super widespread. And so people are like, well, you know, we can solve this problem by paying more money to open source developers uh, or turning them into real companies or starting foundations or all this stuff. And then, you know, my, my response to that is like, actually those things are not, not very fun, right? When you, when you're being paid to work on something, it feels completely different than when you are working on something for fun and then giving it away. And I think people, especially the recipients of those, those software, the, the resulting software, don't necessarily understand the different motivations that people have. So going back to Tailscale, we're a company, we're making open source, we're doing it on purpose because we have a mission that we want to accomplish. We do have quite a bit of money behind Tailscale now. We can afford to, have, to pay people to read your emails and answer your questions. And we do pay people to read your emails and answer your questions. Uh, that's very different from a pure, what I would call free software project, where they're doing it as a gift to the community, right? They're, they're giving you something that they thought was cool, but that doesn't create any 
um, responsibility to necessarily do what you want them to, right? And so the people who show up in GitHub bug trackers and, and start complaining about free software developers not implementing their pet feature fast enough for them, those people are not being reasonable and they're, they, they're making it less fun to give the gift that is free software. Whereas when people show up in Tailscale's GitHub repository and complain that we're like, our, we're doing the wrong thing or our, our ideas are wrong or nobody's gonna buy Tailscale if it's missing this feature and this feature, that's actually, a, that's different because we have people whose job it is to read that stuff, sort through it, uh, try not to get too emotional about it and then set a project roadmap and so on. So I was trying to draw the distinction in there that like, look, there's, there's a difference between what I would call the gift economy that free software started and the interchange of sort of like the market economy that open source and startups are part of. Uh, but when you open up a project on GitHub, you can't necessarily tell which kind of project you've landed on. And the ideal way for you to interact with the developers is different depending on which, which kind of project you landed on. Does that make sense? I, I think so. Um, it's, um, it, it's actually, there's almost like two different moral systems involved. And I, a point you made is that when you, um, gifts are up to the giver, it's just really not up to the receiver. And there's a, um, when you start paying for it, it becomes a transaction that ceases to be the kind of relationship you get with a gift. Um, yeah, the analogy, analogy I used in the article was, uh, if someone gives you a gift, you say thank you, right? Because if you, if you say like, okay, that was that was not great. Next time you get me a gift, here's a hundred dollars, and just get me a gift that's a hundred dollars more valuable than the one you would normally have gotten me. That's like an incredible social faux pas, right? Like if you did that, people are going to be incredibly insulted. But this is kind of what people were suggesting is the solution to the log for J problem. Is like, well, we should just give them more money, and then all of my problems will go away. It's like, well, they didn't do this for money. When you give them money, it completely changes the motivation. Um, and we, we know this like many, many times as it come up in, in social studies and even in companies, when you reward people with money for doing the right thing, it often results in people doing less of the right thing because they'll try to, they'll start, you know, your, your mind is just wired like this. You'll start gaming the system to try to maximize the dollars. And most of the time, the good stuff that comes out of these these gifts is things that you would not have gotten just by spending money. Another example I gave is like, look, some, someone can give you a gift of something you never would have bought for yourself, right? That's what makes it different from a market economy. If they just gave you money and you went and spent that money, you would have never gotten the thing. But this thing might actually be perfect for you because it's coming from somebody else's perspective and they maybe understand a need that you have better than you understand it yourself. And so the value of this free software of people producing what they want to produce and you benefiting from it is a value that you can't get any other way. It's not something that comes out of a marketplace. Yeah, I think it's a really good explanation and one that's needed. I mean, I remember back, you know, in the early days when when I was a bit more of a zealot around open source, you know, it was, I only want to run open source. I don't want to work with a company. You know, I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to create this, this wall where no companies are going to come in and I'm only going to use open source. And then you realize, oh yeah, I've got to hire a ton of people to be able to manage this because like you said, you're not going to be able to, nobody's on the hook necessarily to support your particular pet project or pet feature that you want to get implemented. And so I think it's shifted, at least I hope, I'd love to get your your opinion on this, but I think that the sentiment has shifted somewhat towards it's okay if you're not entirely open source, but if you're a company that supports open source, if that's part of your ethos, if that's part of your if, uh, priorities for your company, then I want to do business with you because it's a win-win for me. I want to use your product and get support for it, right? But at the same time, I want to know that the money that I'm paying you for that project, some of it at least is going towards supporting some sort of open source project at the same time. Does that, do you find that as well? I've definitely, I've definitely lived through a shift like that. It's interesting because I'm not sure individuals have shifted down this ethos versus more people just showing up. I think if you, if you go to the Linux kernel mailing list today, uh, <laughs> you will find a lot of the same kind of people that you found in like 1994 that are just as grumpy about anything proprietary. Uh, as they were back in 1994. It's just that the world has become flooded with with what I would call startup mentality, which is different from open source or free software mentality. And those two, open source and free software, were already slightly different points on the curve. 
right? Yep. Um, I think, I mean, I personally, I really appreciate what startups do for the world. I think it's a lot better than what we had in the olden days back back when we got the Clue Train Manifesto, right? When it was mostly mega corporations trying to talk to us. Startups have a much better incentive to listen to us, at least find the right group of people to listen to and build exactly what that group of people want. Whereas mega corporations have an incentive to just sort of make more or less genericized products that will appeal to millions and millions and millions of people. It's sort of like the Marvel studios of the movie world, right? Where startups can, you know, like the indie developers of the movie world, um, where there's many of them. And as long as you can find the startup that's right for you, they have a huge incentive to make stuff that's good for people like you. And I think that's valuable. There are a lot of downsides to the way things have gone in the startup world. I think they do suck energy from the open source free software world. And in some cases, the the open source version would have been better. One of the worst things about startups is if in many cases, they don't open source all their work. So when, or, or they don't create an open development methodology, even if they did open source their work, right? Like a develop, an open source development team won't just appear out of nowhere just because you open sourced your project, right? So you get pro- companies like CoreOS, for example, uh, that was doing some amazing stuff, but they ran out of money they got acquired, somebody shut it down. And now even though the core OS code is sitting out there, you, anybody could grab it and pick it up and maintain it. Nobody does because that's just not where the energy is. Um, that makes sense. It makes total sense. So what's the, I mean, what's the solution? Is there a solution? How do we, how do we work this out? I think, I think we're going to keep evolving. Uh, I think, you know, what, what I said at the end of, Uh, that essay that we're linking to is basically like, I don't have all the answers. Uh, And I think society itself does not have all the answers. I'm really excited that each iteration seems to be making things better overall. But each iteration has advantages and disadvantages compared to the previous iteration. And the iteration we're on right now, which is like everything is a startup. If I go to a, I remember doing this a few years ago, I went to a, some little conference where I did a lightning talk about one of my open source projects and somebody in the question and answer part is like, well, how are you going to monetize this? I'm like, well, I didn't intend to. <laughs> I'm just giving you this free thing. It doesn't, not everything in the world needs to be monetized, right? Uh, and, and I think that is still true. I think we're right now in sort of the fad of like monetizing everything. We need to get a little bit back to like, you know, sometimes it's okay just to do things because that's something nice that you can do for somebody, right? You could argue that a lot of the problems with culture and society and politics right right now is because we've sort of forgotten this super simple fact that if you just keep doing a little nice thing for somebody every single day the accumulation of all those nice things is going to make your world a nice a nicer place to live and it you don't have to get paid every time that happens and it's kind of funny saying that as the ceo of a company that just raised 100 million dollars right because obviously we have we have a profit motive we are capitalists uh, we want to make money and we're going to spend this money to do good things but it's really important to us to try to find this balance where like we are doing things to make the world a better place. Money is a tool that makes it possible for not only for you to do good things that make the world a better place, but for you to do it in a way that's sustainable. So you can keep doing that for years and years and years. <laughs> We've been having a little debate in our not a debate on our back on our little back channel here. We have we have people in the uh, in a in a in a IRC chat and uh, and uh, and I have questioned. I've, I, we're backed up on questions. Is what basically what we're saying. And Aaron, is this because I haven't been looking yeah. at the back channel? Yeah, I've, I've got I, there's a few questions from the chat room, right? So uh, there's one from an anonymous user. Um, who is asking about how to connect home routers? So this is about Tailscale itself, the technology. Sure. And they're actually yeah, maybe we should talk about, about how that. To, we keep forgetting. Yeah, a little bit. I know, but we're <laughs> so excited about open source here. Um, uh, but they're asking, like, basically, how to connect home routers behind ISP firewalls. And I guess I kind of had the same question, like, when you have by default automatic levels of either VPN or what have you, um, how does Tailscale actually operate in those environments? Uh, so. Yeah, so that is that is the neatest, deepest part of Tailscale is we we play some really interesting tricks uh, that are called as a group is called NAT traversal uh, that lets you allow an incoming connection 
to your device that is behind possibly multiple levels of firewalls. And you can create that incoming connection from another device that is also behind possibly multiple levels of firewalls. And that is not supposed to be possible, right? That's the point of a firewall is to stop the incoming connections. Uh, but the there is this, I guess, loophole. We think about connections as being one way or another, like you make an outgoing connection from behind your firewall out to a server, and we call that an outgoing connection. But the truth is it was only initiated in the outgoing direction, right? Once you've made that connection, the server needs to send stuff back to you, right? That's just sort of, that's how the internet works. I go to a web server, I say, give me this, and it's, it sends you some stuff back. Um, because that always has to be possible, it is possible to trick your firewall into letting stuff back in that looks like an incoming connection. So what you do is you create an outgoing connection to basically nowhere land on the internet. Like you send a packet out to the middle of nowhere and it doesn't land anywhere. It just, it disappears into the, the ether, but you've now created a note in your firewalls, not layer. The firewall says, okay, well, if anything comes back for that, I have to let it back in because connections are always two directional. And so the other end that you want to create a point to point connection to does something similar. And if they have a ch side channel that they can use to coordinate with each other, then it's possible for them to both send a packet out to the same place in the middle cross ways. And then the packets from each one eventually can get through the hole that was punched by your first packet that you sent out in the first place. So that's a little complicated. You can find you can find an article on tailscale.com called How NAT Traversal Works. If you just Google for the, the exact term how NAT Traversal Works, uh, Google will find your article. I think it's the top link. Uh, and it is very complicated. And there are lots and lots of super weird edge cases um, to make all of this stuff work and all kinds of tricks. And there's UPnP and there's NAT PMP. Uh, there's CG NATs, all of this stuff. Um, but the super short version is like Tailscale does that, right? And and once you've done that, that is basically what our product is. Uh, yeah, you found it, Dave Anderson. Um, once you've succeeded at punching those holes and making those connections happen, then you can layer some really fun, magical stuff on top of that because you can make the internet work the way any way you want, even though modern internet has firewalls and NATs everywhere. And it's just a matter of what we call like double opt-in. You can't connect to anything on, on the internet. You can only connect to the things that let you connect by both of you opting into that connection at the same time. It's a really interesting, you know, we talked a little bit already about, you know, society um, and, you know, the, the huge internet creating a possibility for attacks. The attackers on the internet can't attack you if you don't opt in to accepting their attack. Right? That's the neat thing about this method. So you don't exist, really, unless you're talking to someone who you've agreed mutually that you're both going to exist at the same time. Uh, and so it's, it's psychologically it's, uh, or, or sociologically, it is a fix for this problem of the Internet being too big. And that, again, goes back to the name tail scale. Like we are creating small networks. We're dealing with the fact that not everybody has a public IP address anymore because there aren't enough public IP addresses and IPv6 didn't roll out sufficiently to fix that problem. You don't need a public IP address anymore because we can make you exist through this, this kind of magical system. Is that answering the original question? Because I feel like uh, it might yeah. have been too deep. It it does, and and there um, there's more questions piling up there. Uh, I have I have one as well. But first, I have to let everybody know that uh, this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by IRL, an original podcast from Mozilla. IRL is a show for people who build AI and people who develop tech policies. It's hosted by Bridget Todd, and this season of IRL looks at AI in real life. The show features fascinating conversations with people who are working to build more trustworthy AI. There's an episode about how our world is mapped with AI. The data that's missing from those maps tells you as much of a story as the maps themselves. You'll hear all about people who are working to fill those gaps and take control of the data. There's another episode about gig workers who depend on apps for their livelihood. It looks at how they're pushing back against algorithms that control how much they get paid and seeking new ways to gain power over data uh, to create better working conditions. For political junkies, there are episodes about the role that AI plays when it comes to the spread of misinformation and hate speech around elections, a huge concern for democracies around the world. Um, 
on, in the case, we never get political on the show, but that particular episode is really relevant because there's a gigantic, AI is basically has an enormous influence over, over how we get our information and, and how, it, how that all works. So I highly recommend that. So search for IRL in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to IRL for their support. Um, there's um, an interesting thing for those of you who did not hear the ad. <laughs> it, it brings up a, a, a topic of motivation. And I, I want to visit this because there's a, at this thing I went to, there was one programmer, I guess we call them all developers now, but anyway, a, a true, a kind of known 10x quality programmer who, who got, who managed to bid up the nonprofit he wanted to work for on free software um, to like a salary of $87,000 by telling them that he actually had a standing offer for $300,000 from um, from a major company. And there was gift in there. I mean, the, the, what he wanted was to give in a way. And though there was a transactional side to it in the way that he pitched that. So I don't know if you want to talk on that particular topic, but, I, but I'm also thinking about employees because in the last two years, um, you know, nobody wants to go to the office anymore. You know, my son works in a rec for a recruiting company, another startup. Um, and, but a lot of them are willing, you know, I mean, it, 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 there's so many variables thrown into here that weren't there before the pandemic. You went to a rectangular building and you sat in a cubicle or in your own office or in, in your own rectangle. Um, and even if they gave you free food and stuff like that, well, you've got free food at home too. You've got your own fridge, you know, whatever it is. So I'm wondering how that, how that factors for you, especially as you're growing and you're recruiting people. So I think the most important thing to know about compensation, and there's been many studies that say this, but you can, you can put it in, in one sentence. Uh, money and compensation are primarily a demotivator, not a motivator. And what we mean by that is if you're not getting paid enough, then you might be angry. You might not be able to afford to do the thing that you want to do, right? Like there's a, there's a certain amount of money that you simply need in order to be able to get stuff done or to feel that you're being treated fairly or to feel like, you know, you're not just getting ripped off by your employer or, or whatever. Um, if you, if we pay you too little, it's easy to imagine that your productivity can drop nearly to zero. If we pay you twice as much, it's unlikely that your productivity is going to double, right? There's, there's a threshold beyond which more money is, that is hugely diminishing returns. And that, that is not, you know, an excuse for companies uh, to just like pay people less money. But it's important to understand that when someone is, for example, talking to a nonprofit that they want to work for doing open source, and they're comparing that job offer versus getting paid four times as much to work at a um, big corporation doing proprietary software, it's not that shocking that they might still choose to get paid $87,000 working on open source, right? As long as that $87,000 allows them to meet their life obligations and feel like they're not being ripped off, um, then they can be fully motivated and do a great job, right? But if the difference between $87,000 and $60,000 is, you know, not being able to send your kid to childcare, then it is going to impact your, your life quality, right? And so, I don't think there's anything unethical about bargaining up your your salary, even at a nonprofit, to work on open source stuff. It's it's just about what makes you tick, right? And the people who are hiring you have to have to understand how that works. Uh, I think it would be it would be a strange world if um, nonprofits working on open source ended up paying as much as big companies working on proprietary stuff, right? Because most big companies working on proprietary stuff, you know, the employees are doing it mostly because the people are telling you to, right? Whereas people are doing it out of, you know, love and contribution and open source, right? Um, but it's also, I want to draw a distinction between that and working on open source for zero dollars. Nobody really actually works on open source for zero dollars because people have life things they have to pay for. Right. When I do open source for zero dollars, I'm actually doing open source on the side of getting paid for something else that I did. And that 
I think it's unfair when we criticize people who want to get paid for open source just because somebody else like Avery can do open source for zero dollars. It's not really zero dollars, right? And and because my open source, you know, actually Tailscale, I do get paid to work on open source because I've started the company and paid myself. But <clears throat> in that like purified version, I work on open source projects that that are not part of Tailscale. Oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> this was really important. I forgot. Here. I know. <laughs> yeah, we were also um, typing but it's, each other. Yeah, yeah it's, it's back here. <laughs> yeah, when I when I'm getting paid for one thing and I use that money to then go off and do another thing, that can be okay. But it does create mixed incentives, and it means that the thing I'm getting paid for can sometimes steal me away from working on the thing that I might do for free. Uh, and to go back to your question of like, hey, how come Avery hasn't written any blog posts lately? A super simple version of that is I've been really busy at work since we raised this hundred million dollars and I don't have time to go write blog posts. But that's <laughs> that's actually, I mean, totally reasonable. But it, you can see that there's a, a split incentive there, right? Because I'm getting paid for work and also a whole bunch of people rely on me daily. Um, I can't go off and do this thing that I might have enjoyed doing that would have benefited society that I don't get paid for that isn't tied to the company, right? So... Someone who negotiates their salary up so they can work full time on an open source project might be doing the best thing for society. Does that make sense? Cool. I don't know if that was necessarily what yeah, you're going it, for. It there. totally makes sense. No, it totally makes sense. And and Doc, jump in if you want to follow up on that. But I think I do want to get back, and I know we're kind of jumping back and forth a little, but I want to bring in a couple more comments, which I think are interesting from the chat room. Um, and one is, we may have already uh, uh, answered this with your last question, essentially. Um, but Reverb Mike, who is a, a, a regular, I would say, for I don't know how long, forever, um, uh, in the chat room, wanted to, was asking about the mesh network. Like, is, is this basically a mesh network? And how do you keep that mesh network safe for all the nodes? Is, did you kind of answer that with the last one? I'll let you decide if that needs more explanation. Uh, so that's that's basically the other half of the explanation of what Tailscale is. Uh, luckily, we have a blog post for that, too. It's called How Tailscale Works, uh, which you can also <laughs> Google for. Uh, and it has lots of nice diagrams. I actually wrote that one in the pretty early days of Tailscale. Uh, and at the time, some of that was aspirational. We had not implemented all the stuff in How Tailscale Works at the time we published How Tailscale Works. But now all the stuff in there is actually done. Um, so the super short version is there is a, we split the concept of a data plane and a control plane. Uh, and anybody who's built data centers, especially with software defined networking is probably familiar with this kind of stuff. Anybody who has set up um, ubiquity Wi-Fi routers, for example, they understand the idea of like, there's a control thingy. And then there's a bunch of devices that are controlled by the thingy that actually route the traffic, right? That's the data plane. The control thingy is the control plane. So Tailscale's control plane is centralized. All of the instructions for how to connect up, who gets which keys and so on, come from this control server. And then the actual devices do the process of connecting to each other and sending, routing the data back and forth. Uh, and they do that by trying to create these point-to-point -point connections between each other. So the data plane is extremely efficient and very important to our business model. It doesn't send the data through tail scale, which means we don't have to pay for it. It's also a benefit for your privacy. Uh, and it's also end-to-end -end encrypted. So these devices are generating private keys for themselves and they share the public keys with the control plane, which then redistributes those public keys out to the other devices on your tail scale network. Um, but the, so the total amount of traffic on the control plane is quite small, which keeps our costs low. Almost all of your data traffic goes just directly point to point in this mesh network. So you don't need to set up um, a single like VPN concentrator, which is the normal way a VPN works, where you basically have everybody connect to the same VPN server. And then the VPN server is like the exchange point. So you send something to it and it bounces it back to one of the other nodes you're trying to talk to. Your traffic actually goes directly from one node to another. Even if they're on the same network, they can actually create a connection directly on that network without going to the internet and back, but it's still an encrypted connection between those two devices. Does that make sense? So it, it really is like a true mesh network. It's what we call a mesh overlay network which is a little bit different from, say, a Wi-Fi mesh uh, or a, a like, uh, what do they call it, metropolitan area network, one of those uh, free mesh providers, because the Wi-Fi mesh, same concept, but it's at the physical layer. And it's actually really difficult to build meshes at the physical layer, as anybody who's tried to do it uh, would know. So Tailscale just builds this mesh on top of the existing internet. So all of the difficult stuff at the physical layer has been solved by somebody else. Tailscale then just solves the virtual layer 
of creating what looks like a LAN from all of these devices that are scattered physically everywhere. Right. Makes sense. Uh, but doesn't that, and I don't want to take up too much time here because I know we're kind of getting a, a, a towards the end of our time, but doesn't that affect performance though when you do it that way? How does that not affect performance? Well, it affects performance in that it makes performance really good. Uh, so <laughs> the, nice, <laughs> the nice thing about these peer-to-peer -peer direct connections, first of all, the encryption at, at the data plane is done by WireGuard, which we barely mentioned, I guess, so far. But WireGuard is this sort of new futuristic uh, VPN protocol. Um, invented by Jason Donenfeld. Uh, it's now part of the Linux kernel, although in Tailscale, we use the WireGuard Go user space implementation. Um, it is, is kind of like IPsec, except if you can believe it, the amount of code in WireGuard is something like less than one-tenth as much code as IPsec, while still being faster and more secure. Uh, and you can trace its history, um, you know, the, the, the lineage of WireGuard back many, many layers, but the, the first layer back is called the noise protocol, which is what Signal uses, the encrypted instant messenger. And Signal is, is really like, if you read the papers about how the Signal instant messenger works, it is, it is leading edge in terms of actually protecting privacy and security in this really interesting way that is hard to screw up. Uh, there's also a, a really great blog post by Moxie Marlinspike uh, about why Signal is designed the way it is with a central control plane not being in a completely open source federated system, um, which matches a lot of why Tailscale is not a completely open source federated system, even though in both cases, most of the code is open source. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? The performance is really good because you're not routing through a center point. It's just like your device is talking directly to each other over this like space age new protocol that's really fast. Right. You're eliminating the number of hops um, and a lot of the noise at the same time, right? Exactly. Um, so yeah, really cool. Uh, one more question from the uh, chat room. Well, it's actually a comment that I thought, and we may have even talked about this last time, but because I'm into retro computers and fixing vintage computers and history of computers, I found it really interesting. Uh, but Gumby basically said, uh, this was kind of the feel of computer science and the internet such as it was in the 80s. So we talked about the 90s when the internet was first starting, people were throwing up all kinds of, you know, really bad looking websites and things, right? Um, but just before that, in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, uh, you had, you know, ARPANET and things like that. And it sounds like that's actually more akin to what you're talking about, because basically, the, you know, the ARPANET, you couldn't just get on the ARPANET, right? You Somebody had to, like, say, yes, you can get on. And, oh, by the way, it takes this expensive hardware, so you have to be a university or something. So that's a different story. But um, it sounds like it's kind of the same thing. You're kind of limiting the number of nodes and, and what you can have on your particular network. And it really is kind of like a lot of little ARPANETs set up everywhere. Yeah, I guess that, that is a good way of thinking of it. Obviously, the hardware is a lot less expensive uh, than in the ARPANET days because you yeah. don't need any special hardware to do it. And that's one thing that's great. But yeah, you're building your own little... I get, probably the 80s is a better analogy than the 90s because by the time the 90s came around, we were already seeing like ad-supported websites and stuff. And I guess right. you know your tail scale right. network is not ad-supported. Uh, you connect up to it and it's just like... You know, real freedom. Now, there's there's buttons where you can then invite your friends to share some of the devices on your Tailscale network. Um, if you're a company, of course, you can connect multiple people to the Tailscale network, and there's access controls and stuff like that. But it's all kind of optional. So they like basic version where you're just connecting some phones and some Raspberry Pis and some laptops and some desktops and some cloud machines together is really really simple. You just install the package, you log in through your favorite. Uh, identity provider and that's it like you just basically click login with google then you log in with google and like all the devices that you logged in with the same google account now can talk to each other right so it's kind of this this super beautiful like there's you don't have to think about it but a, a huge amount of machinery has gone on behind the scenes to make it just magically work and we have dns mm -hmm. so you can like as soon as you do this you can ping host name of one of your devices and it just it finds the right ip address and you can ping it Right. We have this new thing that we just launched about a month or so ago called Tailscale SSH, where we automatically distribute SSH keys for you. So you can then just like SSH into your Linux machine and you didn't have to get your public key for SSH distributed to the right place by hand, which makes it a lot easier if you're using an iPad or something, which is notoriously hard to get SSH keys onto. Uh, there's an app called Blink Shell for iPad. Uh, if you have that and you use Tailscale SSH, then you simply go into Blink Shell, you SSH to your Linux machine. And it just magically works without you thinking about anything. Right. And so it really feels like like the olden days of the Internet where you were allowed to have a three letter password uh, and just like tell that to machine and it would work. 
So is this something, uh, and this will be my last question, I swear, because I, I could go on for a couple hours. Uh, but is this something I could use for like to secure all of my IoT stuff, that stuff that has those default passwords that like, you know, are, are expose you so much to uh, things coming in and per perhaps uh, hacking into your little devices that you're not even seeing? I mean, is this something I could create my own little network, put all my IoT stuff on there um, in my house, and then I don't have to worry so much about exposing it so iot stuff is slightly tricky because uh it tends to be proprietary software running on this iot stuff uh, and so you can't really install well, not my IoT, stuff. iot device <laughs> oh well if you're running i mean so is this uh, i don't know if you're familiar with home assistant i imagine you probably 100 uh yeah. yeah so home there's there's a home assistant like in the home assistant app store or whatever it is you can download tailscale uh and it just like instantly makes it so now you can connect all your iot stuff over tail scale from any of your devices, even when you're not at home. Uh, and it's, it's super slick. Um, cool. I can't fix the problem where your propri where proprietary IoT devices will go out to the internet and download viruses or whatever. Uh, I, I would like to be able to do that. You need a little more control over the, usually the Wi-Fi router. Uh, I look forward to a day when Wi-Fi routers automatically sort of isolate these devices so they can't hurt themselves. Uh, and then you could sort of Unisolate them by using a tail scale network on top that only allows the things that should be able to connect to them to connect to them. But we need assistance from a Wi Fi router to be able to lock these devices down in the first place. Does that make sense? Because they're just total sense. They're just like, yep. you know, head, head slappingly like terrible code that should not be allowed to talk to the regular internet. But disconnecting them from the regular internet is a, is a job that tail scale itself cannot do. It can reconnect you uh, to your private network once you've save them from the, the dangers of the internet. Right. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. And I think Doc is trying to talk. He's but he's muted or something. I yeah. Was, <laughs> on, on my other mic, I actually have I have a physical cough button like they used to have in radio, if you remember what that yeah. was. And and um so now I have to hit, it's all software. Um, um, what I was saying is we're out of time. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, hey, Doc, you can't if, cut us off if you're on mute. So I know, I know, <laughs> exactly. It's like, it's like I go like this, what, what, what's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. So um, just to, uh, um, I, I'm just going to, Oh no, I, I I can't ask that because it's going to get us into a thread. We're gonna, we're going to have to have you back in another fewer months next time because you're moving fast, dude. So this this is cool. So <laughs> let, let let's just go to you know a question we asked last time, but probably people have forgotten. What's your favorite text editor and scripting language? Ah, well, I mean, we did talk about that last time. My favorite text editor is one called Joe Joe's own editor. Uh, yeah. It came with <laughs> uh, Slackware back in 1994 when I yep. first installed Linux, and I, I sort of just got used to it. it has WordStar key bindings. I'd never used WordStar oh before. I'm God. not quite that old, uh, but I know the WordStar <laughs> key bindings in case I ever run into a retro computer with WordStar on it. And uh, scripting language, I'm a big Python person, but I've been sort of uh, basically all my coworkers are Go people, so I've been I've shoved pretty pretty heavily into Go lately, which is arguably not a scripting language, but is replacing a lot of scripting languages. That is great. That is great. Do you use Joe, uh, Aaron? I did. I remember. I remember it star? fondly. I don't use it anymore, but uh, yeah, I do. Joe is I, still I, maintaining I it. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> oh, wow. There's that's awesome. there is there is an, a free software gift for you. This guy just keeps <laughs> on going. I had no <laughs> All idea by that himself that was still maintaining going this text on, editor. It yep. brings back a lot of nostalgia for the uh, the mid '90s and trying out <laughs> Linux for the first time. So, yeah. It makes up for me of like stumbling over WordStar way the hell back when. So I could go grab my uh, TRS-80 Model 3, which has, uh, I've got the WordStar disc for if you want. And yeah, oh, I might wow. break my back, but I can. I, I had a TRS-80 Coco. Coco 1 was what I got started on computing. And then the Coco 3 was my me uh, too. big upgrade. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Assem well, assembly there's... language in OS 9. That was the, that was uh... the I couldn't afford the C compiler <laughs> or the hard drive. Oh, my God. Yep. The, uh, those were the days. You, you can now. So, um, uh, thanks so much, Aaron, uh, and, 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 and Avery, two A's, 
and I'm going left to right in my visual here um, <laughs> for, for coming back, even though it was a little bit of an error to have you back so soon. Hey, you got a hundred million bucks in the meantime. So it's like this, 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 there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. And this is just fantastic. We will have to have you back soon. So thanks a lot. All right. But not so soon. <laughs> well, maybe we'll see. We'll see. Anytime you want. I'm happy to talk about whatever. Yeah. Thanks, man. So Aaron, that was good. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we had the same, um, uh, 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 last time we talked, we had the same feeling, right? Which is just, it's nice to talk to yeah. Avery. He's got a lot of ideas. He thinks about this stuff all the time. He writes really good, thoughtful blog posts uh, without any ads. I know I brought that up last time, but I love his blog because it's kind of ad free. Adless. And yeah. there's no, no, no distractions, right? It's, it's a it, focused it reading. Look, no knock on WordPress, but it doesn't look like WordPress as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For all I know, maybe it yeah. is, but probably not. Yeah, probably not. But yeah, so so it's just nice to talk to Avery, you know, and obviously, you know, Tailscale seems to be doing really well as a startup. So that's good to see. Um, it's not easy running a start, having, you know, working at a startup myself, I can say it's uh, this is not easy stuff. And it complicates things even further when you're trying to balance uh, open source you know, priorities as part of your business. And so the reason I say that is because it really does say something about startups and companies like this that decide to make the commitment to open source, whether they grew up out of open source or not. And so, you know, I think we should all kind of applaud uh, companies, especially startups when they're so busy, you know, trying to build their company and and respond to their uh, investors and things um, to say, no, look, we're going to make this a priority and we're going to stick with it. It really says something about the integrity of the the people that work there and the founders. So I just really appreciate that he has that ethos. Yeah, and I, I I advise people to look at his um, uh, that last blog post because it's it's the first time I've seen something I would want to show to the guy I know who is from a big company who said about the GPL I don't know what to do with that you know and it's it does it doesn't necessarily give the answer but it gives you a framework to think about it and uh, and to appreciate where that comes from. That it's not just like a kind of pain in the butt. It's actually really meaningful uh, in in a different way than open source is, and you have to kind of work with both those concepts. So, mm-hmm. so Aaron, what do you what do you want to plug, and then I'll plug next week. Uh, well, first of all, I need to thank my employer, Sistig, uh, for giving me. Uh, time today <laughs> to uh, take time out of my busy schedule to be here. So that's really nice that they're able to do that and that they, it's natural for them. Like I said, we're big mm-hmm. open source supporters ourselves. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it, I re- want to thank them and you should check them out if you're interested in Kubernetes security and that kind of stuff. Um, and then also uh, I've got a lot of fun projects coming up on the YouTube channel, Retro Hack Shack. Uh, I've got one that I'm working on right now where uh, restoring a IBM 5170, um, which was the third IBM PC that came out. They had the PC, they had the PC XT or the 5160. And then this is a 5170, which is the PC AT. So it was the first time the, the AT standard was used, uh, to my knowledge, in a in a computer. So yeah, I go through and fix that. And the fun part is I get to uh, hose off. It was thing was so dirty, it came out of a shed. Um, and it had oh, all wow. kinds of leaves and animal droppings. And uh, believe it or not, it basically worked. I had to do a little bit of work, but there was nothing, no major repairs I had to do. But I did have to take it out in the driveway and get the hose out on the motherboard and the, oh the case God. and everything just to get it clean again because it was it was pretty nasty. So anyway, that's a sneak peek. That episode's coming up uh, on Saturday. So check it out. I wanted an AT so bad back in the decade. Oh, my gosh. Um, the one I didn't buy might be the one that you're, <laughs> you had to hose off. Um, so next Could week be. we have a real treat, uh, Brian Bellendorf, who, uh, is now in his second gig with the Linux foundation, but is possibly best known as the primary or a primary author of Apache, which all of us use and, um, hugely thoughtful dude. Big thing about this next week. And remember this for the you live watchers We're coming on an hour early because, other things are going on during the day. And um, so we're early next week. It's going to be Brian Bellendorf. He's always really interesting. Another deep dude. And that is coming up next week. So until then, I'm Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. We'll see you then. Hey, we should talk Linux.
It's the operating system that runs the internet, but your game consoles, cell phones, and maybe even the machine on your desk. But you already knew all that. What you may not know is that TwitNow is a show dedicated to it, the Untitled Linux Show. Whether you're a Linux pro, a burgeoning sysadmin, man, or just curious what the big deal is, you should join us on the Club Twit Discord every Saturday afternoon for news, analysis, and tips to sharpen your Linux skills. And then make sure you subscribe to the Club Twit exclusive Untitled Linux Show. Wait, you're not a Club Twit member yet? Well, go to twit.tv clubtwit and sign up. Hope to see you there.